These photos here, 1933, 1934. So um, Jerry Mission and all the what they, they call the bottom end mob these days, um, their old people were still living in the bush in a traditional manner right through until the till 1940s. And like I said earlier, old Jerry remembers coming in for the first time naked and being laughed at. Australia is home to one of the harshest and most unforgiving landscapes on the planet. The areas that we explore, Cape York, the Kimberleys and Arnhem Land are the harshest of all. Australia is also home to the oldest living culture on the planet. For 60,000 years, Aboriginals have been roaming this country, living sustainably and at one with the land. We've been welcomed into Kawanyama and its surrounding country in the Gulf of Carpentaria, the lower west coast of Cape York. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode. Today we are, we're running a bit late, we've had to refuel the boat here in the river and we're going to be pushing downstream here out to the mouth and then going up the coast. We're taking you all with us as we immerse ourselves into the indigenous culture and explore this remote coastline. Change of plans, guys. We've had word that the river uh, that we're going to run up through to get to the Mitchell gets really shallow up the top, and this tide is just draining out all day. And apparently, if we get we can get up there into the Mitchell, but then we can't get back through. We're not going to have enough fuel to go all the way out and around. We learned from our um, from season four not to take chances like that. So with all the new um, what are they called? What are these things called? Gauges. With our new gauges, we can see exactly how many litres that we've burnt, uh, which is unreal. So we know where we're at. We don't have enough fuel to do it. So change of plans. We're going to shoot down the coast and go into another river system and fish a new um, new honey hole, hopefully. We've seen it on Navionics and it looks okay. So I don't know. The wind's dropped out a bit. Probably going to be a glamour run home. I reckon we're going to time it perfectly. Yeah, I reckon it's going to be a really nice run home. We might hug the coast and give you guys a bit of a look at the coastline. It looks beautiful and it's untouched. I don't think you can get into there to camp or anything. So, unless you had a quad bike on the beach and you had permission to do it. But yeah, again, these systems, you need permission to get into any of these systems and fish them. Particularly this one, you're not even allowed to fish from, like I said before, this mouth is it. You're not allowed to go up and fish further upstream. So, only the indigenous are allowed to do it. And I think if you've got a traditional owner on board, you're allowed to, I don't know if you're allowed to or not, but um, we're hearing mixed messages there, but always seek permission. All right, mate, let's go find a better spot, eh? Yeah,
many potential spots, hey? Look at that. In the wet season, that would all just be just all flooded hay and just yeah. running back here. Yeah. Like just pouring off that edge there. Structure here, but no fish yet. Just come across this part of the river where we got this real harsh, dry landscape up here on the right with like ant mounds and almost like nothing could survive up there. It's so harsh and arid. And on the left, you've got this real dense ecosystem, like shaded, full of life. And here in the middle we got the river and at the moment it's really still we're trying to find some moving water but it's very still i feel like we just went in a huge big circle i reckon we're going to come back to a junction here and we've just done a circle oh look at it up in there just big like a big flood plain fish on the sounders so we'll drop down some vibes Let's see what we can get oh this reel is a bit nothing big to start the day off would be good yeah we're literally starting the day off aren't we yeah and it's 10 to 2 <laughs> what a day it's been nice though hey cruising that coast on the way back yeah it's been nice oh it's about oh, Barra. hey hi Barra. Dane's on. It's just little barra, but First fish of the day. that makes me think that the rest of these marks are barra. At 2 p.m. And they're just schooling up in there. Wow. Where were they then? Why was that? I'd, I put about 15 drops on them. Little rata. What a mission today to get that. <laughs> well, it's been a what, seven, seven hour mission. Seven hours trying seven different hour rivers. mission to get a. 350 mil barra. <laughs> Up and down the coastline in the Gulf. Yeah, it's, we've done about, what, 70 k's. But you got to suffer, don't you? you got to suffer, that's the thing. Yeah. If you suffer, then the good ones are even gooder. Well, let's put him back, get some good fish karma. Yeah. And then I'll play out a big girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I reckon barra fishermen around the world are cringing right now. But... We're not getting a lot of fish, but these fish we're getting are thick across the back. A uh, good, healthy barra. Yeah, you'd be 60, I reckon, just. Ooh, good job, Ooh, mate. It's that wild. vibe again. We're going to have to cut Dane's vibe off and start using that one. No. <laughs> it's the technique, anyway. Oh, the technique. Let's measure him up, eh? Yep. I'm bloody starving actually. I think we could cook him. I spent a lot of time single. And what I found with the bar and the vibes, it's all in the wrist. <laughs> oh, maybe not. Alright, 57. Oh, he's got a dig. Something's had a dig at him, eh? No, 60. 59. 59. Tell you what, nice, pretty, bloody good with a measurement, eh? Must be a chippy. Cool. That might have been your leader, your line. I reckon we put him back and get a big one. Yeah. 
It's a risk. We could keep here and have get another one. Have two, one each. I'm pretty hungry. Put it back and order a 70. I reckon we got it in us. Okay. I reckon we got it. Yeah, I mean we're killing it today anyway. Yeah, smashing it. <laughs> smashing it. Alright. Well, we're only getting bigger. This is double the size of the last one, so <laughs> the next one should be a meter 20. The next one. Good job. And he's off. <laughs> <laughs> what, are you do, what are you doing over there, mate? I'm trying on a big body. So you gave up on the on the tuna lure. Two fish out of both fish on board being caught with this. I'm not targeting 50 centimetre fish, mate. We've got, and Nathan's gone to a tuna lure. As an option. Hey, if we, and now, well, let's be fair, it was mackerel. Now I've got this big dog. Now he's got this big uncooked sausage. I'm gonna see if he can catch it with a bunning sausage. And you guys to see where I'm casting, because there's no point having the camera point where Nate's casting at this stage. At this stage, where the key words are 50 centimetre bar up that way. Big dogs, this way. Yep. Doesn't count, I'm having a drink. How are you dropping them? I don't know. Come on, get off. You can see here, I'm changing over to a vibe. I think that's the colour Dane's got on that one there, but in the bigger model. I'm gonna go. I don't yes. think the colour's got a lot to do with it, to be honest. I like, I put, oh, well, it's the motion of the ocean, isn't it, with these things? The motion of the ocean. But I like, I like the dark ones. The bump. Ah, dropped him. Vibes work, hey? Vibes work. Bloody vibes. <laughs> Here oh, we go. No. Here we go. Look at this. Got to catch them all, hey? Look at that. What do we got? Put a vibe on his head. Jeez. It's a big end. It's not even a big catfish. He's got, he's got something to say, too. Oh, Marcus, a good look at him. Do you want to get the brag mat out, mate? Hold him up. Hold him up. Give us a pick. There you go. There you go, guys. That's what we've come up here for. Done the miles and we got the smiles, eh? Mm -hmm. Gotta suffer, mate. You got a big fish. You gotta suffer, don't you? Yeah. To make the sweet ones no, sweeter. They're actually, they're actually not bad eating those catfish. Yeah, yeah well, I'll That's take your word thing. for it. I'll take your word for it. Barramundi win this round. We're gonna go look for some food in the mangroves. Oh, I hate losing. Round one that um, we've seen you do. See that? Absolute ripper. Look at the size of it. No? Nobody home. It's an old one, you reckon? Yeah. Alright. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there. So, I've just dug this hole out. It had all footprints out the front of it. Ah, there's no one home. I dug him out a little bit. But yeah, you must be out feeding. So you're waiting for something to either snap at the stick or just feel that shell, aren't you? What yeah, I'm just waiting. Grab? When you stick a stick in there, you can just feel them. Movement. They don't like it, so they just they move a little bit, yeah. and you can feel them like a hard thing on the end of the stick. They move, you can feel them move on the stick, and then sometimes they grab it. Should we go for a walk up in this drain and see if we can find mud shell? Yeah, I don't, 
It's just a good spot to get access from the side. Actually, no, it doesn't look dense enough. What about down the bottom there? Is that one down there? To the right, yeah, in there. This one? No. Yeah. Oh, no. No? No. Alright, well, it's shimmy along. Wasn't there another one over here? Oh, there's one here. Well, it looks like it. Looks like some digging. It's a battle. It's a battle. Look at the sun. All right, we've just spotted another crab hole on the way back, well, to the mouth. Try and reclaim some of the day. Ah, another empty hole. Look at all the footprints out the front, look. Look at that. Now, yeah, look inside there. You can see. Oh, he's not home. Damn it. Damn, hey? Was that a root that you could feel? Yeah, there was a there was a, a horizontal root and my, my stick was rubbing across the top of it. Uh, clean you guys. Sorry. Yeah, so I had my stick in and I was just like rubbing it side to side. It felt like his back, but it was just a horizontal stick across the top of the hole. Anyway, another swing and a miss. You gotta struggle. That's the key. You gotta struggle. Today we're struggling. Well, I've decided to leave the boat for a little while because it did not seem to be working. Get up out of the river. But there's a little drain in here. We're just going to, there's wallabies in there, look. We just saw his track. We'll sneak up on him here. Where is he? He's a big wallaby. There's another species up, there's a couple on the cape. There they are, look. See that? Oh, that's so cute, there's a little joey there with him. Was epic. I'm glad we got up out of the river just for that. Yeah, there's a couple of species on the Cape. Um, I'm sure there's some crew out there who watch the show who know what they're called. I think one's called a antilopine or something like that. Um, antilopine, I think that's what it's called. Well, here we are. He's drained. Is there water in it, mate? Hey. Is there water in it? Yeah. Crocky. Good steep bank. It does look a bit crocky. No, it's not really good, eh? It's too dry. Yeah. What are you thinking for muddies? You'd have, muddies, you'd have to be down there in the water. It's not our day, mate.
finally got one after persisting. Persistence, mate. Oh, oh no. no. <laughs> that is heartbreaking. Oh no. Yes, you do. I can accept it, mate. I'll be the bigger man. The community of Kawanyama, meaning place of many waters, was established in 1905, 116 years ago, when pastoral leases began to move in on Cape York. The three clans in the region, Cockerberry, Kunjin, and the Cockermanjana, were gradually drawn from their ancestral lands to live in this new Anglican mission, eventually named Kawanyama. Many individuals were sent away to distant places around Australia, losing connection to their country and their clan. Generations later, some have made it back home. Today, Kawanyama is a beautiful community, rich in tradition and culture. We were welcomed in like family, and all three clans were excited to show us their country as we continue our journey learning about this country we live in and on. associated with Algeria and the crew that come out of the bush. Yeah. So, it's 1934. 1934. Yeah. Wow. And that's his spear. Jerry's spear. That's a he was an initiate in the fish first ceremony. He was like fifth degree. 94 for fifth degree. So he'd been to four or five. They're at Bora's, you know, ceremonies. And he made that. That's Lance Wood. And he's the one that no, that's Ironwood. That's Ironwood? Yeah, um, he's the one that made all the nose pieces and all the bone tools and stuff. His, his father is the one that helped this old fellow that took all these photos to do his article on steel axes for Stone Age Australians. It, it was the impact of the steel axe. And this old fellow lived in the times when the stone axes were, were used, but they were using steel axes by that stone. Well, okay. So we met Viv when was that about a week or two ago. Um, we bumped into Viv in town here in Kawanyama and he invited us in here to have a look at the collection that he's collected over how many years? 50 years. 50 years. 
Crazy. Yeah, I, I came to Konyama in um, 1972, 19-year-old, and I've been here most of my life. Went away briefly for a family business one stage, and and um, I'm a bowbird, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Collector, yeah. My bush name, my bush name's Crab Turkey, but all the old fellas reckon I should have been called bowbird. Yeah. That's what Chappie reckons too. Uh, yeah, just a, sorry, did say that. Yeah. Avid, avid collector. Yeah. So you've you've been up here just living and breathing in Northern Australia and, and yeah, Kanyama. Yeah, Kanyama. I I um, arrived when the last of the bush people were still still around that generation that yeah. left the bush in the 1940s, mm. and were living in the bush through the 1930s and 20s. Yeah. And they're gone now. Yeah. Yeah, and some of those old fellows, like old Jerry, that's left his legacy here in in the collection. He remembers the day that he walked into the mission with his father and and mother and the others from the bush and um, being laughed at by the by the mission kids because wow. they had no clothes on. Wow. Yeah, so it's pretty special because it's a collection that's not just um, it's not just an anthropological collection. It's an historic one. So we, we during this journey of <laughs> collecting, um, and especially in the last 10 years, we've got to meet some pretty interesting people that were pioneering, you know, settlers back in the 1800s. Um, you know, the Atherton family, we've got material from their, their family collections, and we've met great-grandchildren of that, those, those people, mm. the Palmers, and the Jardines. They passed through here and um, famously known as the Battle of the Mitchell when 30 men were killed out on the Alice River, not 40 kilometres from here. So that's an important part of history. It is, yeah. Yeah. And that's what you want to show, hey? That's why yeah, it's, it's here for, for the mob here to be able to tell, the, tell their, yeah. their story, you yeah. know. And some people ask, why would you want weapons that have shot people and, and, and things? But um, it's just about the objects. And the story, mm. you know, because it did happen. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's There's no point in hiding it. No, no, that's right. And our yeah, this is our chance to give meaning to the objects. And it's a bit of a race against time, as you know that most of the old people have gone now. Jerry died in two thousand and two. So. All right. Well, we don't have a whole lot of time today, but no. what we want to do is show show you guys. We'll just touch on Viv's favourite parts of this, so that when you come to Kalyama, hopefully the museum's pretty close and you can come and see what this collection. Yeah. Because our exciting part for this year is to try and get a cyclone proof shelter for, for the collections because it is um, a priceless mu uh, museum collection. Mm. It's been described as one of the largest of, of its kind in Australia. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Are our, these are our priceless gems and only because of the legacy that Jerry left. Um, he worked with uh, he and his family and particularly his father old Philip um, White Metal Bodden. He uh, worked with Sharp when he he was doing his thesis as a young student from Harvard. Yeah. And um, his father took, you know, he li they lived in the bush in a traditional way in, uh, in those days, 1933, 34. And so he was able to make um, functional tools and, and things. And the stone ax was an important part of uh, Lauriston Sharp's visit during his studies and we road tested one of the stone axes that Jerry made on um, on that on that, on, that uh, on that tree it was a white gum it took 10, 10 minutes to cut had to cut it like a beaver to keep it clear of the yeah. the bindings we cut two trees like that and then our cool about half that size all in 10 minutes each so they were functional axes and Jerry was able, and the other old people were able to give us, you know, the meaning to the meaning to the objects, you know, stories. Is, is this old Jerry's? Yeah. 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 So the other day we were out cutting ironwood root, both Dane and I, with a with a modern axe. Yeah. And it was bloody hard work, and it made me think about this and really appreciate the effort that they would have, they were, and the time they would have taken to yeah. just to make a spear. You know what goes into it. And these are the ones they used to, they used to cut a little square hole in the side of the tree when they were climbing a tree with footsteps in the tree. Mm. All that was, it was like a pick. Yeah. And it cut a little square hole about this, this big. And they'd hook the honey out that way because you couldn't cut a whole tree down, a whole ironwood tree. They just didn't do that. You know? 
Can we touch on quickly these? Because this is something that I had no idea about is how creative the Indigenous were back in the day. These were obviously some kind of fishnet. Yeah, these were used in pairs be between two people. Yeah. So used that nice, way. Yeah. 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 And so in little mangrove creeks and things. Yeah. These are made out of palm fibre. They wouldn't have normally used them in uh, palm fibre. They'd use the um, fig tree bark, yeah. which is much stronger in salt water. It disintegrates in salt water pretty quickly, palm fibre. And what a lot of people don't realise is that a lot of Aboriginal groups use fishing lines. And up up this way, they use like a bonito pole, you know, with a short with a short line, a wooden hook. Sometimes it had a bone point on it. Like this one. Yeah, and. That was when we've recorded most of the crocodile attacks because it puts you too close to the water. Yeah. And Jerry's brother was taken by a croc when he was with him and he was talking to him in, his, oh, in the crocodile's so mouth. Chills up his and then his auntie, his father's sister, was taken by a crocodile and they were both using them. Really? Yeah. Uh, so the croc had him and he was still able to say he's He was in a little narrow creek and there was nothing he could do. They were little boys, eight, nine years old. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, all our lancewood spears. These were made by two people, mostly, with most of them. Um, there's some 1950s ones here, from taken from Gregory's Downs, but they're not a Gregory Downs um, style, so they must have been some of the Gulf um, mob working on the station and they made themselves some hunting spears in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. um, but these other ones were all made in uh, the, the 2000s, well, all within 15 years. And when iron arrived, what's called the shovel spear in the Northern Territory is called a knife spear here. And they, they were used, particularly became useful for killing cattle. Yeah, they were the cattle spearing spear, but they were also pretty nasty for fighting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a man spear. That's a man spear? That's yeah. For war? Yeah, it's not... Just because it's prong doesn't mean it's a fishing spear. All the fishing was done with these. Really? Yeah, and then the, the bird spear had a hollow shaft, and each of those prongs with the bar barbs on were pushed in and packed in with, with shavings. And when you speared the bird, you had to pull the tail off the spear and push each prong through the bird. And then you'd pack them all back. Yeah. yeah. And you'd do that as well, you know, and then that'd, that'd keep them spread and tight because you didn't want them rattling. So, so men would carry, shifting between camps, several spears. Each man would have different spears. Oh, when they were in, because in this place here, uh, people tended to stay in camps a lot longer than, say, in the desert or somewhere yeah. where you had to be moving all the time. Yeah. Um, so there were established camps. Okay. And most men would have a, a, a number of spears. Some they'd have a surplus to their needs, or they'd use those for trading or whatever. Mm -hmm. But also they're high maintenance, so, mm -hmm. you know, you, um, you had somebody, uh, Sharp, found that the the crippled people, or the you know people that could weren't mobile, they tended to be the craftsmen, mm. and so um, the others in the camp would give them the spears and wanders and stuff to fix. Um, do you think this is a like a dying art form, a dying trade? You know that all these old these elders are passing away. It's a real struggle, and of course this is what this museum is about: is about the transmission of cultural knowledge mm. and practices and. People like old Edgar um, and uh, others, Jerry, old Wa uh, Warwick Chook, my brother, they all lamented the fact that you know the young young people weren't interested in yeah. in a lot of this stuff. But every now and again, there's somebody that you know somebody pops up, and there there are a couple of people here in town, um, Leslie and and Boydie and and different ones that are that are doing good work. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them are the equal of, of some of the work of the of their mentors, you know? Yeah. So this is the fibre collection? That yeah, you these are all the, all the different kinds of baskets. Does everyone in town still weave like this? Only a couple. 
a master weaver is it takes a lifetime to get it get good at it yeah. like any craft yeah. always, always women yeah we had some one smart fella come through one day and said oh you know i'm not going to pay that much for a basket i can buy them in woolies for a dollar fifty and we said well it's not woolies and it's and uh, you're not paying a dollar fifty for them <laughs> and um and then he said oh they were made by a machine anyway what? he couldn't believe that somebody how perfect it is yeah well, it, it really is so in the 70s, they're paying $20 and $30 for a basket like that. Now, okay, $20 or $30 was worth more, you know. Like my pay was only 40 something dollars, you know. Um, but I commissioned this in the 70s. And so this is over 50 years old. Yeah. That's made by the Am family. And I asked for a basket the way they were, the size. And we ended up with the largest basket in our collection. At, um, so, you expect to pay for something like this today? Oh, something something that big. Certainly not twenty dollars. Being closer to a thousand dollars, something. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, a lot of these other baskets generally go for uh, three or four hundred bucks. Yeah. yeah. So th these are things that, like, with the fishing nets, that I, I didn't even realise that the, the Indigenous were doing these things. Look, yeah. No one really knows this stuff. Mm. And I think it's really important. It's really important, yeah. yeah. I suppose a lot of it is lost because it's certainly it's natural yeah. materials. It's lost in the bush, bushfires, floods. Two collections here, the Palmer collection. Bombers and there's a shark tooth knife without the shark teeth on. Yeah, we've probably got the best collection of bombers in Australia for Cape York. It's amazing. Yeah. And now we've added... We're just continually adding. There's one was in this other 50s collection as well. Yeah, you can see the difference. So that's quite short, and then that one's quite yeah, long. long. Yeah, from two different areas. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes they were traded in. You know, yeah. this is the beginnings of the Atherton collection, the John Atherton collection, which is Atherton Tablelands, right? A lot of these, a lot of these objects aren't from the Atherton Tablelands. Mm -hmm. But that's John Atherton's revolver holster, which belongs in Atherton, and eventually that'll find its way home. Okay. Yeah. But this is this is what what was described as a Mitchell a collection of Mitchell River wombers. Now the Mitchell River understands the really big river it goes right across yeah. to yeah. the wet tropics on the east coast. So um, they're not necessarily all from Kanyama. No. You can see that the difference, the, the, yeah. ones, the ones I've seen are square and then these two are... Yeah, and these, some don't even have a, a knock on the things there. Well, these, these could quite easily be, um, you know, outside Mareeba or something like that. Oh. But we do have photos of men with wombers like that at Old Mission, but they must have been traded in, they weren't yeah. general. This is the weapon that um, most of the native police used, and this is actually a Queensland government issue. One, yeah. Tools. And these are the old, um, yeah, the old fellows' legacy. These, um, among another a number of other old men as well. But these are a, a really good cross section of the bone tools. This is a heel drill. It's just made from a leg bone of a wallaby, cut green, so split green while it's still able to be split. And it's it's held between the heels sitting squatting you know sitting on the ground and the spear shaft is drilled down on top of it and it drills the hole up the guts of the the um, the so rod the shaft, so yeah the spear, guys, the spear yeah. shaft has a hole in it which then i'm not sure if this is one but they then get inserted into a shaft one of those shafts yeah the softwood shafts and they're softwood you know and you had to work within like you do with any tool you have to work within the limitations of the tool yeah. But that's an all, so that's for picking out. The thing about these is we can put names to, you know, that was made by Frank George, an old man called Old Tiger. That's made by Banjo, Patt Banjo Patterson, you know, known as Old Runky. Um, these are Jerry's. That's Jerry's, that's a splitting tool. And you won't see these in museums. This was talked about by a number of explorers and, and anthropologists on the peninsula. It's actually like a spoke shave. All the viewers will know what this is. Mm. Everyone sees us eat mud shell. Yeah, that's a mang mangrove shell, or commonly known everywhere as um, a mud shell. And that was used to 
Right. It was used like that, like a yeah, for taking off the branchlets and stuff when you needed a little bit more force than using a scraper. Okay. You know, you'd use the same so thing. Mud shells were just used as a tool. As well. Oh yeah, yeah. People carried them. Well, the thing about a mud shell is you can carry it in your dilly bag lie for a while, quite a while, yeah. and eat it later. Yeah. But um, the green shells were used, and they yeah jawbone um, engraving tool, so that's used. Oh, yeah. All right, and that's what they put the shark teeth on. The and you can use a pocket knife and you usually cut yourself. It's yeah. one of the most efficient things to, yeah. to do because you you bite the end off, the, po the, the pointy bit. Yeah. You can always tell the ones in middens where they've got the end missing. This one hasn't and it makes it into a little chisel and you just start straight like that and make a line and then you just gradually twist it and you you make it wider until you've got a groove and that's where the bone points for the spheres went into and this is this is a, a shark tooth knife where all the shark's teeth went into that groove and, and this thing here I don't, I don't know a better term, but it's like endemic to this area, isn't mm, it? Yeah, State and River to the Coleman. Okay. So the Taiwa, some of the Taiwa people right through the Cockerburn and the mob down State and Riverway, Massa Riverway. And the men would have and the... What was this used for? Wrap your string around the, around the wrist and you use it like that. So it's raked across the back and leaves a t trail of tears because okay. those things come out. There's Oh, yeah. That's actually, that's old men parry. That's the, you know, great, uh, the grandfather and great grandfather of heaps of people around here. And that's what kids carry it sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, you must have around walked very, very carefully yeah. when you had it. And then when you're showing off, you had to have it dangling off your elbow, they said. But you, you've got to watch out because they, they're incredibly sharp. Yeah. And if they, you know, hit you on the leg because you've got no clothes on, mm. <laughs> and you, you're going along there with it off your elbow. With it. Yeah, that's a catfish skull, and that's a top end, top end message stick, for want of a better description. Mm -hmm. And what it, what that is, uh, they'd be carried um, out at the towards the end of the year when the lagoons are all drying out and people are getting the you know stunning fish. Mm -hmm. Well, all those they you just didn't just go out and stun fish. There were ceremonies around it and protocols and everything else. People had come as far a field as Munkwan country, Holroyd River, and follow the drying lagoons and help out because it's a big job and a lot of fish were taken. Yeah. So they, that was that was the message stick. For, so that would be hung near the lagoon where it's happening? No, no, just off the, just off the elbow again oh, or, okay. you know, and um, it would just be carried around. And it was like... Um, and there beads on there again? Yeah, it's just been fancied up a bit. Yeah. But the message sticks here were clan own, owned, so the designs were clan owned. So they were really more like a passport than anything else. Mm. A lot of the message was given by mouth. Unlike some other places where, you know, things are different, you know, cultures are different throughout Australia. Canon. The canon. So this is this is a canon that was um, taken from from the mouth of the South Mitchell River at a story place called Min, uh, called Nar. And it had been there so long that people were wondering what this mysterious object was. And um, it had ended up as a ritual object. Oh, really? It was used in a ceremony. And the only reason why this other fellow in 1919 found it, because um, everybody else knew it was there, um, was that people looked after it. We kept it out of the sand, otherwise it would have got buried in the sand, you know, yeah, and, and got lost. Yeah. But back in the 70s, we became aware of, of this thing. And then we talked with the old fellows and they said, oh, yeah, there was a, there was a, a you know, something taken from the South Mitchell mouth. So someone came in and took it? Guy came yeah, there's a fellow who's on Lochnagar Station, which is an early station near Rutland Plains, mm -hmm. predates actually Rutland Plains. And he was on his horse, and Jerry said he was very lucky there wasn't anyone there because he wouldn't have left the place, t taken a, taken their thing. Yeah, 
but it, it's a shared heritage object and we, we claimed it under the Cultural Heritage Act um, and it took us quite some time to get it from the Queensland Museum because it had been sent by the mission. He delivered it to the mission and then they put it on the boat to TI and around to Brisbane on the steamship, yeah. And the, the carriage, the carriage was made in the 1920s and it's a signal cannon similar to ones that are on the HMAS Victory and Flinders era. Um, nobody knows how it got there. Yeah, so we, we, I mean, every time we lose somebody here, particularly those really old fellas, we lose encyclopedic yeah. amounts of knowledge. Yeah. yeah. I think you need to create this museum and have every piece under glass with your description. <laughs> Next to everyone, because it all tells a story. Yeah, or Jerry's, you know, yeah. Jerry's or Chilks or whoever. The, yeah. yeah. These these photos here, the 1933, 1934. So um, Jerry Mission and all the, what they, they call the bottom end mob these days, um, their old people were still living in the bush in a traditional manner right through until the till 1940s. And like I said earlier, old Jerry remembers coming in for the first time. Um, Naked and being laughed at. What has she got on her head? Yet? That's a cool woman. A cool woman. Yeah. yeah. These are that it, that's a dish. It's a, just a big hollow log yeah. of uh, corkwood. Yeah. Same material yeah. the shields are made out of. And the great thing about this photographic collection is it was taken by Lauriston Sharp, who was an emeritus professor in the end at Cornell University and very sharing, loving sort of old, old bloke. Um, I went across to see him and I was in uh, the States for two months. By the time I got back, after going through his collection, there was a bundle of photos ready for me with all these field notes written on the back in pencil. So we were able to say these two people here who were still alive up until um, the 2000s and ni late 1900s. Um, old Norman Jr. who was a senior sergeant and his brother, that's their older sister, that's his, uh, her wife, uh, her husband, and that's her again grinding lily seed. So all the photos that we got back from, from him during that time we can connect to living people. They're not just photographs, you know, they're, they're and those, the really great thing was that these two people and their other sister got to see them mm. yeah, before they yeah, passed, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. It, um, well, yeah, we really appreciate you yeah. sharing your knowledge and your, your time and everything with us. It's, it's honestly, it's amazing. It's, it's a highlight of our trip. So guys, if you're coming to Kawanyama, make sure you, you drop in and see with you. Because give yourself some time and take it all in. It's amazing. Thanks, mate. Thanks, sir. That's a wrap for another episode, guys, up here in Cape York. If you like what you're seeing, make sure you subscribe and tell your mates, share it. Um, down below on here on YouTube, there's a little share button. Hit that. Go on Instagram, share that with your mates because we're on there a lot on Instagram. Um, make sure you give us a thumbs up if you like what you're seeing. That really helps us know and to keep pumping out this content. Um, thank you so much for all the support. Everyone that's buying shirts and caps and stuff, wildreaches.com. Jump over to patreon.com, we're on there as well. Um, if you want to help us keep doing what we're doing. We're having an absolute ball and we appreciate each and every one of you. So, see you all in the next episode. Yeah, behind the scenes in Wild Reaches, every time we cast, we're like, see, watch this, and cast. Yeah, it'll happen this time. Ready? One, two, three, cast, Barra. Yeah, see, watch this. <laughs> and then if it doesn't happen, we just edit it out. Most of the time that happens. <laughs> yeah, now it's got a nice stick here. Add that to the catfish collection. Anyway, it's super slow, there's no run. Middle of the day, it's hot, we've got no food, so we might go look for something else. Not assisting. <laughs> <laughs>